Hey everybody, today on Rotto Runs Through, I'm gonna start ranking my collection. Oh yeah, now this is something I have been doing dutifully and diligently, but behind the scenes for years now. But I've never really kept it a secret. Anybody can um, go to rank.rotto.com or ranked.rotto.com. There's a link for it down in the show notes. That'll take you to my collection on Board Game Geek, but you'll find that I have ranked every game in my collection that I have played. I'm using the Board Game Geek 1 to 10 star system. And I've always been doing this to keep track of how I rank all my games relative to each other. But that's led to some weird stuff, like Dice Realms getting an 8.34484. It's not like I'm that granular about how specifically I think Dice Realms plays. It's just that it had to go above Flourish and below City Trip Bruges. And that was a number I could squeeze in to fit there. So, this has been kind of a weird, wonky system I've been using for a long time. And, um... It's gotten more unwieldy as time goes on, and you get to these really weird circumstances. Endless Winter, Paleo-American, 8.44975. But even worse, sometimes I'll come in here to rank a new game, and I'll find that, oh, it's definitely better than this one. But it's not quite as good as that one. But, wait a minute, that one, I have worse than that one, so this is literally an impossible thing to reconcile, because the three don't work. And so, <clears throat> I've been thinking for a while, that I needed to revisit the whole thing and start over a uh, clean slate. Um, and then something interesting happened. Because in case you don't know, folks, every week I do a uh, live stream on Twitch, on Twitch Tuesdays. I do all kinds of stuff. But there's always a main event, and then I've got to do something when I'm waiting for folks to show up, because it takes a little bit once the stream starts. And so really what I've been doing for the most part is unboxing games. And people seem to enjoy that. A little bit of chit-chat while we're waiting for the show to start, some unboxing. But for the run-through, I or for the live Twitch I was going to do this week, I realized, oh, I don't have any new games that I'm particularly excited to unbox. Um, what am I going to do? I'm not quite sure. Uh, I mean, I, I, it'll be okay. I mean, I'm just supposed to talk to people? That won't do. And then I had an epiphany. Because the day before, I had been watching Paul Grogan's Gaming Rules. Paul Grogan saves the day, comes to my rescue once again. Um, he started recently a series where he's doing live streaming of ranking his own collection on Board Game Geek. And I sat down and had started watching that while he was streaming live, and I found it mesmerizing, hypnotic. I constantly was second-guessing every one of his things, smiling when I agreed with him, grimacing when I disagreed with him, and it was just great, really compelling stuff. And he was having fun doing it, so I thought, hey, why don't I give that a try? Why don't I make that the warm-up for uh, my next live stream? And I did, and everybody loved it. I had a great time doing it um, using the Pub Meeple Ranking Engine. Now, there's a link down in the show notes for the Pub Meeple Ranking Engine. There's a link down in the show notes for Paul Grogan's um, series of ranking his own collection. Trust me, you will enjoy it. If you enjoy my channel, you will have a fun time watching Paul agonize over his uh, decisions he has to make, like I'm about to do for you right now. But anyway, if you're not familiar with it, you can come to the Pub Ranking Engine and rank beverages, or characters, or comic books, or food, or people, um, TV shows, video games, but most importantly, you can rank board games. And what you do is, you go there, you load up your Board Game Geek collection, um, and then it will start sending you through, as Paul is demonstrating here, a series of A-B comparisons. Now, Ranking Engine uh, from Pub Meeple tells me, I'm going to have to compare two games 2,000 times to get everything all worked out. And that's going to take me a while. So this video today is me taking the live stream I did, packaging it into a YouTube video, and you folks have to let me know. Is this fun? Would you like to see this series continue? I know my live audience over on Twitch loved it. Would you, the audience on YouTube, like to see these updated as I do them over the coming weeks? If so, let me know down in the comments, because this is a big experiment. This is stuff I've always done behind the scenes, behind closed doors. Um, and when you get behind closed doors, you find out how I rank things, and that's what we're doing today. So, again, I have to say huge thanks to Paul Grogan for the ID. You can hit that I in the top right corner screen or follow the links to go check out his version of this. Um, but maybe after you finish mine, because we're going to get started ranking.
right now. Although I should say, by the way, folks, I am still overcoming a cold. While I was live streaming, I was sucking on these things as well. So, and you know, doing a little bit of back and forth with the audience. So it might, it might be some weird stuff, but hopefully you'll enjoy. Again, I can't wait to hear what everybody thinks. Uh, so on with the show. Alrighty. Eaten by zombies or steamed donkey. I don't know if this is always going to rhyme every time. Ooh. I'm going to say Eaten by Zombies. This game does not get near enough love, and it's a really sad story that it never caught on. Because I know the designer tried to self-fund a, uh, an expansion for it on Kickstarter, and it failed. Always broke my heart. And, um, oh, I need to put this in the foreground so that when I push left, it will be chosen. Eaten by Zombies. The network... Oh, wow! Right out of the gate! Jeez Louise! Networks versus Furnace. Now, one thing, I am considering all of these not based on the base game. If it was just the base game, it would be Furnace in a heartbeat. Easy peasy. But I am considering the expansions that I have as well. I'm considering it as like one big thing. And the expansions for Networks are amazing. So I think it, without the expansion to be furnished, with the uh, uh, expansions, Networks pushes it over the top. Glory to Rome or Yoko. Wow! Gosh! Why is it just picking everything that was like an 8.4 and an 8.43 and making me choose? I, I should have some easy ones here. Hmm... Um, I know, right? Tell me about it, whoever just giggled. It's ridiculous. Okay. I think, in an earlier, a younger me, I would probably say Glory to Rome. But as I have matured, I have found I have less and less patience for games with Take That. And Glory to Rome does have a little bit of, you know, kind of, the, I can go fish against you and, and stuff like that. Whereas Yokohama is just about flawless, so I'm going to pick Yoko over, uh, and I don't think that would have been the case years ago. Oh, wow. Federation versus Boone Lake. Hotness and even hotter hotness. Oh. I'm gonna give it to Boone Lake because Federation, as much as I love everything about it, it does have a little bit of focus on area control. Whereas Boone Lake, I think overall, is much more live and let live. So it's just a better fit for us. But these are both excellent games. So Boone Lake. Paris, New Eden, or Forenza. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm. Paris, New Eden. It was one of the uh, first games to really popularize the entwined uh, dice drafting, and it did it brilliantly. It's become such a thing nowadays. Entwined drafting, Cascadia, you know, all the rest of it. But as Paris New Eden was way ahead of the curve. But Forenza has that classic, what do you call it? Uh, the small world style drafting of, oh, I really want that expensive thing. I got to put all my money on the previous things. And honestly, wow. I think... If this were closer when Paris New Eden came out, I'd probably go with that. But there have been so many entwined drafting games that have really pushed it to the next level. Not that Paris New Eden isn't great, but I'm going to give it to Forenza. Village Green versus Viticulture. Oh, that's a pretty easy one. Village Green, after the change they made, because Jen and I had a problem with it, and so they made a special official variant, the Rotto variant. With that, Village Green, definitely. If, although, wait, 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 no, no, that's base Viticulture. I own Viticulture World, and Viticulture World is fan freaking tastic. Now there won't be any expansions on this list, so but I have to consider Viticulture as a summation of all the stuff I have, and I have Viticulture World. And so, based on how phenomenal the co-op is, even though I'm kind of disappointed they didn't put any difficulty scaling, that's a real bummer. That's a that's a black eye and not a feather in its cap for all the uh, Joseph Heller fans out there. But I'll still, in spite of that, give it to Viticulture. Oh, plus, I've, that's another thing I do. I always rate these not on house rule variants. Oh, but no, when did they become official? Right, so Village Green could have... Anyway, anyway. Dog Lover, and then they held hands. Oh, Dave Kirkhop. A personal friend of mine from Malta. Oh, I broke one of my halls. All right, I might have to swallow this. It's, it's starting to make a lot of uh, uh, saliva in my mouth. But anyway, Dog Lover... It was like a top 10 of the year. And Dave, I love And Then We Held Hands, but it's a sweet little abstract game um, that I have for nostalgia as much as anything else, whereas Dog Lover is a top 10 of the year. And so, Dog Lover, definitely. Turn in Taxes or Feast for Odin. Now, this would shock people to say that I would be definitely, just based on the base game, I would take Turn in Taxes over Feast for Odin. Feast for Odin with just the base game without the Norwegian expansion... I didn't keep. I got rid of it. I was so disappointed by some of the design decisions in that game. But Norwegians fixed all the problems. And so, um, assuming uh, Norwegians, it beats turn and taxes. Alrighty. 
Praetor, and Witchstone. Oh. All right. I am going to go Witchstone. I mean, Praetor had that really cool thing about, um, you know, it's dice worker placement, but your dice age. And, you know, it actually replicates. Ancient Rome, apparently, was the uh, first society, in the Western world anyway, that supported the idea of social security and retirement benefits. And you can literally retire your dice. And I always love that. I think that's lovely. But Witchstone is so cool and fun and puzzly. And it's got so much replayability. I'm going to go with Witchstone. All right. Cloud Age or Foreign Trajanum. Ooh, Feld versus Fister. Didn't have to wait long for this. Hmm. Wow. You know what? I'm going to give it to Fister because I am always a fan when he does his, hey, you know what? Here's my game. It's great. It's a standalone game. But hey, here's a campaign you can play through. Six chapters. It changed things and gives you a little bit more reason to keep coming back. Every time he does that, I love that. I wish more publishers would do that. That's what puts it over the top. Although Forum Trajanum is one of Feld's best. Viceroy versus CV. Hmm. Okay. CV is probably going to be that because I love it. Although CV has really been supplanted by Pursuit of Happiness as the ultimate modern Euro-style game of life simulation. And Vice Boy was very puzzly, as I recall. Okay, I gotta swallow the rest of this stuff. This gets getting crazy. Mm. All right. Mm -mm -mm. Viceroy, that was the thing. Oh, where everybody was building a pyramid, you were trying to get the marbles, you know, the, the, the lights together to match colors. That was really nice. I like that one a lot. But no, I mean, uh, the, the, the sheer charm of CV wins out. Discordia. New hotness versus role player hotness from uh, days gone by. Jeez. Oh, <coughs> <coughs> wow. I don't know. What do you think, folks? Of course, probably most of you haven't played Discordia because it's brand spanking new. I love Discordia's um, dice worker placement stuff and the dice manipulation. And I love the, uh, you know, it's got that Anno 1800 thing where you're um, bringing more people in to your, uh, you know, the more successful you are, the more people come in and you're just trying to find jobs for everybody. But Role Player is just so phenomenal. Such a great, great puzzler. And so, uh, it's, 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 such, it's, the, it's, it's like the ultimate thematic um, tile layer because the theme is, oh, I'm rolling up a D&D character. Okay, I'll give it to role player. Oh, but oh, that's really tough. Because uh, Discordia is great too, but I'm going to give it to role player. All right. Railroad Revolution versus Runebound 3rd Edition. Now, Runebound 3rd Edition would not stay in my collection at all if it weren't for the, um, I forget the name of it, but the expansion that made it co op. And that was really, really good. I liked it a lot. And I liked Railroad Revolution too. I mean, you know. I, I, are we at a rest in peace? What's your game by this point? Maybe we are. But Runebound's approach to co-op... Actually, thinking about it, R R um, Shay and I, we did a, a shared final thoughts for the Skyrim board game the other day. And the stuff that I really liked from that Skyrim board game, now I think about it, Runebound co-op, 3rd edition, did really well also. So I'm going to say Runebound 3rd edition. Okay. Uh, Goblins vs. Zombies and Quadropolis. Oh. <sighs> All right, a very cool little um, cooperative. Although it had a competitive mode, but it was really ideally played cooperative. It's basically plants versus zombies, except uh, they replaced the plants with, uh, with goblins. Uh, but you know, it was. I know there was an official plants versus zombies board game, but that didn't come anywhere near as close to capturing the brilliance of that video game as goblins versus zombies did. But Quadropolis from Days of Wonder is one of the best light, straightforward Sims. It's got to be Quadropolis. Uh, you know, it's it's a strong, fun, thematic theme, a thematic cooperative game with really smart card hand management versus incredibly cool, puzzly, really vice-like restrictive drafting. I think it goes to Quadropolis. Okay, Tiny Epic Defenders, and now this is Tiny Epic Defenders with all the expansion stuff versus Glenmore 2, which has all the expansion stuff built in. This is blasphemy, folks. Total blasphemy, but I'm going to say Tiny Epic Defenders. Because Glenmore Chronicles, Glenmore 2, uh, the, you know, the new stuff they threw in was great. 
uh, and you know neat ways. To, but I mean, they made a core change to Glenn Moore that made Glenn Moore weaker, and it always just kind of sat wrong with me. So I'm sure this is blasphemy for most people. And Tiny Epic Defenders is still one of the greatest cooperative uh, fantasy games there has ever been. It's basically like a little mini um, hyperspeed pandemic, and we love it. So I'm going to say Tiny Epic Defenders. Gasp. All righty, first class, all aboard, and free radicals. <clears throat> mm. First class. Oh, that was it was incredibly tension filled card drafting. Right, a big communal card draft, trying to grab the cards. They disappear so fast. You're constantly losing out on stuff you need. It's just impossible to keep up. And just a really satisfying. I think it's from a couple of eighteen. Uh, was it Helmet? Uh, you know, eighteen XX designers. But a really wonderful Euro. But Free Radicals. I have to give it to Free Radicals. The insane. Um, design of that game that brings 10 completely different disparate element or you know, asymmetric games that all work well but then come together in a competitive game where everybody's trying to help each other for their own it's, it's incredible free radicals over first class railroad ink deep blue versus akrotiri I'm going to say Akrotiri. Even though Akrotiri is a pickup and deliver, this is one of the best pickup and delivers there ever was uh, because you don't spend all your time slowly moving from one place to another. I mean, and Railroad Inc. is fantastic. This is, by the way, a summary for Inc. If, 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 now, if I had all four Railroad Inks, if I had the yellow and the green as well, those might go up top. But this is a stand-in for I only own blue and red. And really, yellow is the best Railroad Inc. And if I were comparing Railroad Inc. Yellow to Akrotiri, it might have a chance. But otherwise, Akrotiri is so brilliant. Deserves so much more love. Did I hear it was getting a reprint soon? Anyway, CO2, Second Chance versus Four Gardens. Boy. <laughs> what an interesting choice. Um, I want to say CO2, Second Chance. I mean, I... Uh, but... It's weird. I mean, I, I talked earlier about how as our tastes have matured, as we're getting older, we are finding it harder and harder to be able to muster the mental fortitude to scale Mount Vital Lasarda with uh, his games. Whereas Four Gardens is just so pure and clean and simple and fast and elegant. I absolutely love it. And uh, plus, my wife absolutely adores the gimmick or gadget as she would call it of the the four towers that rotate the different floors rotate independently i'm gonna say four gardens and i'm sorry vital it's not to me i don't love your stuff it's just my, my, my brain my brain okay uh Onurim versus king domino duel oh boy this is really good at making tough choices um, I was hoping there'd be a lot more nines versus sevens, but it seems to just be doing nothing but eights versus eights, back to back to back. King Domino Duel is much better than King Domino. King Domino Duel is a roll and write of King Domino. Onurim, of course, has all that flexibility and variability with all the different, but Onurim, interestingly, is not the best of the Oniverse games. So, I'm going to give it to King Domino Duel. Okay. Botanic, the uh, latest game from the designer of Jaipur, versus Tobago. Um, I have a lot of nostalgia for Tobago, and Tobago does some very, very cool things that I wish some other designer would say. Wow, the um, you know, I mean, some games have done the Tobago style. Hey, we slowly reveal parts of a map, and you know, but Tobago still does it best. But Botanic is such a wonderful two-player, incredibly tension-filled game with, again, with um, all kinds of opportunities for players to... Oh, of course, these are both games where players are creating opportunities for each other, aren't they? I'm going to give it to Botanic, though, honestly. Although, man, those components in Tobago are brilliant, too. But no, I'm going to go Botanic. Okay. Sea Trip Brews or Star Trek Missions? Uh, Star Trek Missions. The Fantasy Realm system in any form... I mean, Sea Trip Brews is a fantastic, wonderful... Uh, roll and write. Uh, you can play along with me and Ruel. You can download a copy and print it out and see if you can beat Ruel. So you can try for yourself. But as it is, uh, it's Star Trek. Even if it's not my favorite Star Trek, man, I wish uh, Star Trek missions focused on the OG crew instead of next gen. But still, regardless, uh, Star Trek missions. Dragonfire versus Paperback. <sighs> oh my gosh. Oh, boy. Now, Dragonfire, of course, is basically a fantasy retheme of one of my top tens of all time, Shadowrun Crossfire. But it's not as good as Shadowrun Crossfire. I mean, they made some changes. 
<coughs> when they uh, when they did it, that really to try and make the game easier, they kind of weakened the game overall. They, I mean, they added some cool stuff too. But at the end of the day, Dragonfire is not as good as Shadowrun Crossfire. Plus, they only took us halfway through a, a campaign that you know we're, we're caught up on, and the campaign will never end because they lost the rights. So it's like a perpetual... It's like one of those uh, Netflix shows. They, they got canceled at the end of the first season, and it left with a cliffhanger. So I'm not crazy about that either. And Paperback is just so good. So, so good. I mean, it, uh, Paperback did the impossible. It made me actually fall in love with word games, which I thought would never happen because I hate Scrabble so much. Um, so I'm going to give it to Paperback. Let's see here. Um, Curse of the Temple. Escape versus Thermopolis. Oh, that's a pretty easy one. No offense to Thermopolis. Thermopolis, by the way, is a game that I think only 20 people in the world own. Uh, it was a freebie, a uh, gift with purchase if you went on the first ever Cardboard and Sun um, uh, package holiday deal. And uh, Tuco Tukalia went, and he was the designer of Eclipse, and he said, hey, you know what, for this, I'm going to design a, a fun little game. And it was a fun little co-op, or best solo, but a fun little co-op game. I've kept it all these years, but it's more as a keepsake. Uh, whereas Escape is is in Jen's top ten of all time, and I really still love it. So Escape, Curse of the Temple. Alrighty, Space Explorers versus Amon Ray the Card Game. Those are two excellent, excellent games. Wow. Space Explorers really deserves a lot more love. It is such a good card drafting and engine building game. But Amon Ray is basically raw crossed with um, Amon Ray the original game. <coughs> if I could only own one, which would I keep? I do like the Space Explorers theme more. It is much more thematic. But I do think the gameplay of Amon Ray card game is better. So, oh... Is it, though? Is it? I mean, one problem is, I have played Amon Ray card game more recently than I have played Space Explorers. Can I skip? Can I come back to this? No, I can't. It makes me, forces me to choose. All right, my gut is Amon Ray card game, so we'll go with that. All right, Arion, which, by the way, I, earlier I said Oniverse is not, uh, Onirim is not the best game in the Oniverse series. Arion is. This is the best uh, from Shady Torbay, although I have not played his new one yet. Uh, Silverian or something like that. But anyway, versus Capo de Capi. I, hey, it's a co-op game with a uh, you know, sweet, wonderful, whimsical dream world as opposed to a uh, mobster, dice-driven area control game. Now, here's the thing. I have to give cr caps to Capo de Capi that um, it's so good that we keep it. Jen hates the theme, the Prohibition-era mobsters and stuff. And, um, you know, and, and area control is not her favorite thing either. So, I mean, it deserves l mega kudos. For even giving me a second to pause, but I ultimately will go with Arion. On tour, one of the best rolling rights of all time, versus Verdant. Oh, or Verdant. Verdant, Verdant, Verdant. Oh, that is tough. Okay, is anybody in the chat? How, I mean, somebody must have played both of these. Oh, I see. Board Grain Bree is uh, uh, bemoaning that I didn't pick Space Explorers. I understand. That was a tough one. That was a very tough one. That could have gone either way. Last says on tour. Oh, 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 you know what? Just showed up in the mail the other day. The new On Tour Vegas. No, no, not, not On Tour Vegas. On Tour New York and Paris. And those two things really elevate the depth of On Tour. Without those, it would be tough. I might push Verdant. But with, because this On Tour is going to be a stand-in for all of that, I'm going to go with On Tour. Okay. Carnegie versus Dungeon Pets. New hotness versus old hotness. You know what? I'm going to say Dungeon Pets. Actually, it's not that hard. <clears throat> because um, Dungeon Pets is nearly perfect. Carnegie is not quite. My biggest problem with Carnegie, aside from subject matter, um, is that I really would have wished there was more variability in the uh, departments you can install in your corporation. They're all pretty samey. And so... You know, it's, it's the same problem I have with uh, Black Angel. That, I mean, the the different things... The things are supposed to be great variety from game to game. There's not enough variety within them. So, I'm going to go with Dungeon Pets. Plus, Dungeon Pets is amazing. Teotihuacan, City of the Gods versus Kashgar. <coughs> Merchants of the Silk Road. Well, if you were just the base game, it'd be Kashgar. Easy. 
Because Teotihuacan, I was very disappointed by how bumping worked. And I thought it was a really missed trick. Like, the coolest thing about the game was designed in such a way that it pretty much never happens. Um, because nobody ever bumps anybody in the game. But they did, they did kind of address it. In the, uh, the, and I know there's been like three expansions. I've only played the first one, if I recall correctly. And I've got the second one. Or I just haven't gotten around to it. So many games to play. But even still, they addressed my biggest problem with Teotihuacan. But not in a way that I personally would have done it. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But I still think my way would have been better. Whereas Kashgar, I have no notes. It is a perfect um, three at the same time engine building game. So I'm going to give it to Kashgar Merchants of the Silk Road. Warsaw, City of Ruins versus Pergamon. Warsaw is one of the best tile layers of all time. Pergamon is a very, very cool... Um, do you call it Pusher Luck? No. Is it an auction? No, it's really unique. It's kind of hard to describe it. I haven't played it for years. But um, I, my, uh, tile laying is one of my favorite uh, mechanisms of all time. So I think it's going to go with Warsaw City of Ruins. Or, or Capital, as it was previously known. Madeira versus Euphoria. Now here's the deal. I love Euphoria for it's just everything about it is just so audacious and out of left field and unique and quirky. And I don't know if it introduced worker placement bumping, but uh, if it didn't, it was certainly one of them. And whoa, hey, board game geek, welcome to the party, everybody. You are right in the middle of me ranking my personal collection. Now I'm not going to do my entire personal collection today. Uh, apparently, I barely even made a scratch in the surface there. Um, do I have to save? Uh, yes. Um, please save. What is day today? Today is one slash three. I assume this would have been saving as I went. But I'll get a better save in case I crash or something like that. So, I'm just doing A-B comparisons using the Pub Meeple. I'm going to be doing this for like another, I don't know, five or six minutes. And then I'll do some more back and forth with the audience. And then I will film, I will tell you, countdown, the 21 best games Jen and I played. So, if you want to hear about uh, maybe dozens and dozens of games in quick little microbyte format, you've come to the right place, because I'm going to tell you about all the games today. So, stick around, get comfortable, uh, and uh, thanks, uh, 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 Lincoln and Nikki, or Lincoln and Nikki. I almost got that, you know, uh, uh, Lincoln and Nick. or anyway. So, Madeira versus Euphoria. At the end of the day, as much as I love everything about Euphoria's quirky, offbeat nature, I think Madeira is the better design. So, I'm going to go with Madeira. City Skylines versus Indus 2500 BCE. I love the idea of a cooperative Sim City game. Um, I love the idea of a cartog or cartographer's style roll and write that doesn't have any nasty take that, unlike cartographers. So that's a good face off. But ultimately, cooperative Sim City is is more novel and engaging to me. So I'll give it City Skylines, Grand Austria Hotel, and now this is including the Let's Waltz expansion. And Origins First Builders, which I wish was, I mean, I, there, an expansion for that is coming out this month, <clears throat> which maybe would let it win. I mean, Origins First Builders is an amazing game from, is it Adam Kapinski? But no, I mean, Grand Austria Hotel is one of the OG greats of modern Euronus, so it's got to be Grand Austria Hotel. Uh, is there anybody who would disagree with that? I don't think so. Even the designer of, uh, even Adam Kapinski himself would, would, uh, would agree. All right, Cubitos versus Selenia. Ooh. It's interesting, they're both kind of race games. Alexander Pfister versus John D. Clare. Cubitos is so cool with its variability. I mean, you know, borrowed from um, uh, automobiles. Uh, Selenia. Selenia is basically the spaceship portion of uh, Black Angel turned into its own standalone game. It's very, very good. It's really chillaxed and laid back. Whereas Kibitos is very, very high energy, tension filled. I think I'm going to go to Kibitos for that reason. Uh, all things being equal, I tend towards tension filled games as opposed to relaxing games. All right. Morels versus New Frontiers. <coughs> Morels is lovely, but it is still just at its heart a simple, charming, engaging little card drafting set collection game 
with a subject matter I don't care about at all. Whereas New Frontiers is basically Race for the Galaxy turned into a board game. And as far as I'm concerned, it improves on Race for the Galaxy. So I'm going to give it to New Frontiers. Okay. Um, Heroes of Tenefer versus Rococo Deluxe Edition. Heroes of Tenefer, probably one that most people haven't heard of. That's a, It's a neat little cooperative fantasy deck builder where every time you beat a monster, you take the card, flip it upside down, and then that's a reward that gets added into your deck and we're working collaboratively trying to delve multiple dungeons at once. It's really neat. I haven't played this expansion. I do have the expansion. I'd really like to try it. But Rococo is amazing. And this deluxe edition added so much cool stuff. And it's so gorgeous. But here's a Tenefer. Man, all things being equal, I prefer cooperation to... Uh, you know what? I think I'm going to do a big upset. I'm going to give it to Heroes of Tenefer. Oh, Natillion uh, versus Roll Through the Ages. The Bronze Age. I mean, that's an easy one just for nostalgia. I mean, Roll for the, Through the Ages of Bronze Age was like one of the first five games that I played after I got into Modern Desire board game because Pandemic brought us in. And of course, I'm going to try another Matt Leacock game and it turns out it's amazing and it's still one of the best rolling rights to this day. Uh, and Natillion is great. The only problem with Natillion is, you know how all the Oniverse games have a lot of uh, little modules you can turn on to mix and match them? Natillion, it feels like you have to turn them all on just to get a core game. That the core game itself isn't rich enough without all those elements turned on. So I'm going to give it to the Roll Through the Ages. Okay. Beer and Bread, New Hotness. I think, isn't that what you folks were just watching on the uh, the Board Game Geek TV? Versus Cosmic Run Rapid Fire, which is the Roll and Write version of Cosmic Run from Steve Finn. Wow. How did uh, Lincoln and Nikki like Beer and Bread? Uh if uh, anybody from the raid is still here. Because um, I like it a lot. Boy, do I like it a lot. <sighs> but Rapid Fire is a very, very good roll and write. Much more thematic than most roll and writes. But it is a simpler game. Beer and Bread is just about... I think I'm, I have to give it to Beer and Bread. I, I have to. I have to. It's so good. I mean, I've, I've said Beer and Bread might be um, Scott Alm's best design to date. Not my favorite. That would still be Tiny Epic Defenders. But anyway, Spring Meadow, the best of the Rosenberg polyomino light games that, you know, you did like this whole, like four or five of them, versus the Great City of Rome. Oh, wow. A uh, definitely forgotten to the ravages of time. And that was a very, very cool game. But here's the deal Great City of Rome gameplay is fantastic. Really good, sharp, tension-filled game. It is also, sadly, one of the ugliest games to come out in the last decade. And I, mean, I don't blame the artist. I'm sure the artist was just following the remit they got. Because I think I went and I looked and, hey, this artist has done really cool stuff elsewhere. But this was... it. I mean, the, bo the box art is the best thing about the game. It's so ugly. Whereas Spring Meadow is wonderful. And it's the best. Because it's... Uh, because unlike the other Uwe Rosenberg polyomino tile layers, he actually paid attention to Tetris and said, hey, you know what? All the pieces have to come in from the top and slide down. And that creates that extra level of tension that really ratches it up. So I'm going to go Spring Meadow. Okay. Fleet, the original Fleet, the card game um, uh, auction game, versus Helvetia. Helvetia is the reason I am here today, folks. Helvetia is the reason I picked up my iPhone 4 and started filming games because there was no video for it on Board Game Geek and people were asking for it. And I said, okay, I can try that. And Helvetia has so much really cool stuff from one of my top 10 designers of all time. Or once, I, don't, I do not know if Matthias Kramer is still in my top 10 designers. When I did my top 10 designers, gosh, must have been over half a decade ago, he was in the top five. I might have to reevaluate that. But still, Helvetia is one of his best. Um, you know, and hey, so far ahead of its time because it allows for same-sex marriage and all kinds of stuff too, which is very, very nice. Or wait, no, didn't it? No, it didn't. That's right. Uh, actually, I don't remember now. But here's the deal. I have to include the expansion for Fleet. And with the expansion, it added an automated dummy player for auctions and made... So it's one of the best two-player auction games there is in the market because of the way they implemented the uh, dummy player with the expansion. So I'm going to give it to Fleet. Okay, the Magnificent. Ver oh, progress list updated. What does that mean? Does that mean I don't have to hit the save button? Because I feel like I should hit the save button a lot. Oh, or does it just mean that, hey, we've moved up a little bit? I guess this is the progress meter and we've got a long way to go. 
The Magnificent versus Sriracha. Oh, I bet you no. Has anybody here heard of Sriracha? Um, if not, it's because you haven't been paying attention to my channel. I did a run through for it. It's really neat. But it, it it's it's a nice light little um, clever card drafting game. But Magnificent is. I mean, they wear their heart on their sleeve. It is a magnificent game. You know, um, pulling so many different things together. I think I have to put the Magnificent. I have to give it to that one. Targi versus Eminent Domain. One of the best two-player head-to-head dually style games of all time versus um, Seth Jaffe's masterpiece, one of the greatest games that Tasty Minstrel Games ever published. I mean, Eminent Domain has all that... I mean, honestly, I'd rather play Eminent Domain than Puerto Rico, quite frankly. I think it improves on Puerto Rico. And it's just a really satisfying... It's a deck builder. It's so... Upsets the deck builder paradigm in really cool ways. But Targi is such a brilliant little game. Plus, I do have that Targi expansion. Actually, I have all the Eminent Domain expansion. I haven't played them all yet. I think, I think I'm going to give it to Targi. Sorry, Seth, wherever you are. Riverside versus Glass Road. Uh, Glass Road is one of Uwe Rosenberg's best. Riverside is a wonderful roll and write. Yeah, but um, one of Uwe Rosenberg's best of all time. Yeah, that's a, 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 a really lovely roll and write. It's not going to beat that. Acropolis, brand new tile air versus Black Angel. Uh, I love Acropolis. I love the expanding outwards and upwards. I love the thematic integration of how everything scores. But Black Angel is is a work of art. I mentioned this earlier. My only complaint about Black Angel, I wish it would get an expansion to make some of the objective um, uh, planet-y type uh, cards have a little bit more variety to them because they are they play it a little safe. But even still, it's such a brilliant game. I think I'd have to go with Black Angel, definitely. Cryo, a wonderful worker game from um, Tom Jolly and... Uh, Luke Laurie, Luke Laurie. Versus Queen's Architect. Oh, wow. Queen's Architect. It's got to be Queen's Architect. That is such a cool, one of the coolest, uh, another one of those games that has an incredible gimmick or gadget, uh, you know, that really tracks the passage of time. It's kind of like Zulk in the Mayan Calendar if there were lots of little individual time uh, gears all working independently. It's really cool. I highly recommend it. Um, for all the time machination. What you're actually doing, it actually kind of reminds me of the, of last year's Teletum. Teletum had a really cool next-gen um, action selection mechanism, but then you were doing kind of boring stuff in the world, just traveling around and building guild houses. Same is kind of true for Architects, or Queen's Architect. But yeah, those, those gears of time that you're constantly manipulating are too good to pass up. It's amazing. Okay, um, Subastral versus Solar Sphere. These are two excellent games. Um, Solar Sphere, or Subastral. Ha- oh, that's the thing where um, if you draft from the left or the right and you're building the biomes, Solar Sphere is the dice worker place. I, I, so, you know what? Solar Sphere, um, if I recall correctly, I said, hey, it actually improves on Castles of Burgundy in certain ways. So if it improves on one of the greatest Stefan Feld game of all time, it's got to go for Solar Sphere. Avenue, one of my favorite Roland Wrights, versus At the Gates of Lo Yang, one of my wife's favorite Uwe Rosenberg games. Here's the deal. To play to make Gates of Lo Yang palatable for us, we have to home, we have to house rule it uh, to remove all there's just so many negative attack steely cards in that game. Why are they there? They'd serve no purpose. The game as is. I mean, it's easy to change. You just take those cards out. But I always wonder, does that mean I break the balance somehow? So, whereas Avenue is just about high-tension, route-building, um, <clears throat> roll and write perfection. So, uh, don't tell Jen, anybody, but I'm going to give it to Avenue. The Whatnot Cabinet. Oh, one of Steve Finn's best. And K2. One of the greatest race games in board game form of all time. I would be inclined to give it to K2 because normally I don't like race games. And so a race game I actually like really, you know, that bumps it up quite a bit. But the ending of K2 can be so incredibly anticlimactic and almost broken. It's not broken. It's just thematically broken. It can be so thematically broken. Whereas Whatnot Cabinet, again, I have no notes. It's just about 
perfection uh, for King Domino style drafting and then really tense tile laying on top of it. I'm going to give it to the Whatnot Cabinet. Gutenberg versus Fuse. Those are two very different games. Gutenberg, a very, very cool, big, crunchy Euro with amazing components. Fuse, st I'm going to give it to Fuse. I love co-op games more than competitive games, and I love real-time games that Jen will play with me. And um, and this game is just about just about perfection, so it's got to be Fuse. Not not, not a slang on um, Gutenberg at all. Solar Draft versus Hallertau. Oh, that's a hard one. Solar Draft, one of the last games Tiny or T Tasty Mistral Games ever produced, and sadly, one of their best, quite frankly. And I don't think anybody ever saw it. It's a really cool little drafting game where we're getting planets, trying to make our own solar system, you know, jostling them around. Really good stuff. And the way it um, anthropomorphizes the planets is so charming. Hollertau is a return to greatness for Uwe Rosenberg. And I know not everybody agrees. Uh, it seems like it's a very Marmite-style game. But I thought Hollertau, the, with its million compounding uh, objective, co uh, cowboying to objective, to objective, to objective, to objective, was so good. I'll have to give it to Hollertau. Okay. Um, Charterstone versus Miramis. Miramis is great. And I love the uh, core... The, the coolest thing about it is a worker placement game where, oh, there's these objectives. If I want to score this objective, I have to sacrifice my workers to tag the objective so I can score it. So you always have this tough choice of how long do I keep my workers and then somebody else grabs the objective I want. But Charterstone is so... Imp I mean, Jen and I, we played through Charterstone, I was going to say twice, but one and a half times. Um, we, we had two copies of it. And uh, sadly... We'll probably never get a chance to finish it. Um, David and Angela, someday we will get back and we will finish it. Because the second time we played, we were playing with some friends of ours in England, David and Angela. And we had intended to... It's like a whole thing. But uh, Charterstone is just too wonderful. And it's a reflection of us. And it, you know, it has so many uh, lovely uh, legacy-style memories. So I'll give it to Charterstone. Um, it's a Wonderful World versus Luxor. One of the greatest race games versus one of the greatest engine building games. Well, seeing as how I prefer engine building to racing, I do think It's a Wonderful World get, is the win. Oh man, that's such a great game. Especially with all the expansions and they add story campaigns and all that. Luxor is great, but it is a race game, so that's going to not rate as high for me. Notre Dame. I think that was the this was the first Steffenfeld game I ever played. Versus Anachrony. Maybe... David Turchie's greatest game to date. Um, oh, thank you. Um, is that Mir for subscribing with Prime? Hey, we're getting closer to unlocking more stuff. That's cool. <sighs> Nobody tell Dave, but I mean, it's Stefan Feld. Come on. And it's still, uh, I, the, Notre Dame would still, I think, if I were to update my top 10 Stefan Feld games, I think Notre Dame would still make it. Uh, it's still, to this day, one of the best examples of closed drafting, um, you know, in the industry. So yeah, I, I got to give it to uh, Notre Dame. Plus, I love the rats. I love the pressure of, you know, the mounting plague and all that. Grand Carnival, a wonderful tile layer versus My Sharp, a, um, a game that fixes Machi Koro. Oh, those are really close. Those are really close, and that's where I say save. I am done for the day. Save my progress, please. All righty. Uh, update. Update my save. All righty. Progress list saved. <laughs> folks, we are done with that because I didn't want to think about that. This is getting tough. That is tough. So I don't know, folks. What did you think? Was this interesting? Was this engaging? And that was the end where I did a bit of back and forth with the live audience who said they loved it. And so they can expect to see that in the future. But again, folks, you have to let me know down in the comments if you want to see this stuff on the YouTube channel in the future. Because I'm going to keep working on it. And as you saw, it's going to take a while to get through it all. And uh, I would like to know if you'd like to be part of that journey. And so, okay, folks. Uh, that is it. Thank you very much for watching. And uh, if you want to catch more of this, if I'm going to continue, you might want to hit that right there to subscribe. And in the meantime, you can hit some other stuff over there. There's plenty of more things on the channel too. And uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye. And won't you please click because uh, this ends in, what, probably five, four, three, two, one, zero, negative one.